So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Turk Family Fundamentals webinar series. My name is Danielle Walker. I'm the Assistant Director for Parent and Family Engagement here at the University of Maryland. Uh, for those of you that are new, this webinar is intended to help you become informed consultants on campus resources that, that you can better support your Turk. Uh, today, we're joined by staff in the Department of Fraternity and Sorority Life. Uh, they're going to discuss the National Pan-Hellenic Council, um, organizations at Maryland, uh, the process for joining those organizations, and how you can support your TERP uh, as they navigate through that process. If you find that you have questions uh, throughout our webinar today, please, please feel free to submit those via the Q&A feature. Uh, so to access the feature, you'll find the two conversation bubbles towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, it should also say Q&A. Um, if you don't see that, you may need to click the three dots uh, to expand your toolbar. Uh, to help us answer questions that the majority of you have, um, I ask that you use the upvote option. So within the Q&A feature, if you see any questions that you would also like the answer to, um, instead of typing that same question, just select the thumbs up icon. Um, that's considered an upvote. And so we'll, we will be prioritizing those questions um, once we get to the Q&A part of our uh, session today. Um, also, I wanna remind folks to uh, look at the answered tab. So if you do answer questions, um, once we respond to those questions, you'll find the responses in that answered tab at the top. Uh, we'll do our best to respond to as many questions as we can uh, before the end of the webinar. Uh, lastly, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on the Turk Family YouTube channel uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, and so refer back to your confirmation or your reminder email um, for a link to our YouTube channel. So with that, I will hand off the presentation to our FSL colleagues. All right, thanks, Danielle. So again, welcome Turk family. So we're so happy to have you here. Uh, so we are digging into um, historically black fraternities and sororities at Maryland uh, that are part of the National Panhellenic Council. So to quickly introduce myself, uh, my name is Hamed Sirleaf. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I serve as one of the coordinators for advising and programming here in the department. And I'm also the primary advisor for the National Panhellenic Council. And Joel? Hi, I'm Joelle Latore. I am a second year master's student, and I'm this is also my second year serving as the MPHC grad advisor, and I also serve as a resident director on Fraternity Row. So Joelle will be here helping me answer questions that you may have. Also, she may have some uh, <clears throat> great perspective as she is an alum of Maryland, and um, although like she is not um, a part of uh, MPHC organization, she has an extensive amount of knowledge um, about the MPC community here. So glad to have her on here. So getting into the webinar here. Um, so just want to talk about our community at a glance. So uh, I think our sometimes our community can be very confusing just because of all the different organizations that we have on campus. But to be able to break this down for you, um, all of our fraternities and sororities are grouped together in governing bodies, also known as councils. So those councils help to manage the day-to-day -day functions of organizations that are similar in nature. Um, and also we are a student-led, student-driven um, type of department. So we really encourage our student leaders um, to take charge of their fraternal experience. So uh, quickly, so we have um, our other three councils that are uh, on campus that we will also have webinars for down the road. Our interfraternity council, also known as IFC, so those are our historically white men's fraternities. Um, the multicultural Greek council, also known as MGC, so that those are our cultural and identity-based fraternities and sororities. And then uh, the Panhellenic Association, uh, which are historically white women's sororities. So, um, you know, also recognizing not everyone is on the gender binary. So, um, if your student um, does, does not identify as a man or a woman, woman, but would still like to join, um, they'll just need to talk to the organization of their choice to see what those policies look like. So going into what is MPHC. So MPHC is the governing body for historically Black fraternities and sororities. So this is the National Pan-Hellenic Council. So that's what it means. Pan-Hellenic means all Greek. So, and these are Greek letter fraternities and sororities. So again, uh, these are the governing body for these organizations. So also known as the Divine Nine, um, as it's affectionately called. Um, MPHC serves as a space of unity, advocacy, uh, and support. So these were uh, so these organizations came together in 1930 to serve as a coalition. They want to be able to help 
um, serve the Black community, help uplift the Black community. They realize we are stronger together um, than apart, and we all have similar missions and similar values. So why don't we come together to serve a common goal, to reach a common purpose? So a big question that I always get in my role is like, why are there, you know, historically Black fraternities and sororities? Why are there historically white ones? And, um, what, what's the difference between all of them? So to do a quick history lesson here, um, to really talk about how these organizations got created, uh, Black students in the early 1900s were finally allowed to attend predominantly white institutions, um, more so Ivy League institutions such as uh, Cornell or Harvard. So although they were allowed to go to class um, and be able to get degrees, uh, being able to integrate into campus life was really hard. So in most ca cases, they could not join clubs or organizations like historically white fraternities and sororities that have been there, you know, since the 1800s. And, and also in some cases, they couldn't even live on campus. So in in that space, they really wanted to create space of their own, um, Black students, to be able to help each other persist, uh, to find community in, in each other, and also to support each other. So that's how historically Black fraternities and sororities were created. So from there, uh, the Black fraternal movement, as I like to call it, then spread to historically Black colleges and universities, also known as HBCUs, um, where they were still trying to find community, but they were trying to um, build community among the best of the best, that talented tent um, that's sometimes often talked about. So <clears throat> although students from all backgrounds are welcome to join MPAC organizations today, um, we still want to recognize their historical founding. So this is why we say historically Black, this is why we say historically white, because we don't want to erase that history, um, that culture, that tradition, um, of how these organizations were founded. So also to know if your student is non-Black and they are very interested in joining, um, which is very common here at Maryland, uh, it's very important that um, to understand that the work, the service, the philanthropy that MPC organizations put in are geared towards uplifting and supporting Black communities, especially here in the Prince George's County area. So some examples of that, um, over the past 110 years plus that MPHC organizations um, have existed, they've led the way in advocating for Black people. They've led the way in, in advocating for the Black experience here. So uh, MPHC members such as, uh, you know, so Dr., uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, you know, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, Baird Rustin, um, I could go on to help to let the lead efforts um, in the civil rights movement. Also, MPC sorority women led the charge in the women's suffrage movement to make the move to not only have a uh, women's right to vote, but also Black women having the right to vote. So um, it's definitely a very beautiful history, like you really dig into the research um, of it all. So even locally here on campus, um, for, so these organizations at Maryland have existed for 50 years, and over these past 50 years, uh, MPHC has led the way in the Black student movement and Black student leadership um, at the university. So uh, our students uh, throughout the years have led the efforts to establish the shuttle UM, so the, the buses that students take um, from building to building and uh, to uh, from uh, outside apartments to the campus, um, that's that's MPHC students at work. Um, so also collaborating with other organizations to help support creating the night ride because um, in the late seventies, black women um, we were scared to uh, walk on campus walk uh, on campus at night. So with uh, combined efforts from the Black Student Union and MPHC organizations. Um, they helped to create the night ride, which years um, later, you can just use an app to be able to uh, call and be able to receive a ride from wherever you're at to get to wherever you need to be. So also these organizations have helped protect the uh, Nimbaru Black Cultural Center, uh, which is the pinnacle of like um, Black student involvement at in Maryland from racist threats, from bomb threats that happened um, in the mid 1970s and also creating a very great Black UMD tradition, such as Block Show. Uh, Block Show was created in 1985 as a senior celebration for Black students on campus, and now it is a treasured tradition 
um, where everyone across the Washington DC area loves to come out and support um, Maryland and PHC chapters um, do things such as step um, and stroll and being able to celebrate uh, the end of a hard uh, of, a, of a hard working year. So um, I'm very excited to be a part of that uh, as the advisor. So one thing to know about MPHC organizations um, that these are values-based organizations. So what do, what do we mean when we say that? So values-based is saying that every fraternity or sorority has a shared set of values they believe in and help to drive their organization. So in the beginning, uh, a lot of these organizations use Christian ideals and values uh, as their focus, but really shifted to a common set of values um, that they believe their members should live by to become their best selves. So it doesn't mean that you have to be um, of Christian faith, but it's just saying these are a set uh, um, of values. These are a set um, beliefs of, that we want our members to live by to become their best selves. So they are not to meant, they're not, these organizations are not meant to compromise your students' values um, or academics. So there's been um, some trends on social media about uh, people denouncing from their organizations um, because they felt compromised in their faith. These are not meant to do that. And they were not founded for that. Um, they're only uh, founded to help enhance, um, you know, whatever your beliefs are, your academics, and just the person that you are. So how does being in an MPHC organization benefit your student here at Maryland? So first, MPHC organizations help to benefit your student by reimagining learning. So MPHC organizations uh, give plenty of experiential learning opportunities through being engaged in community service, uh, whether that's you know going in, um, you know working in a working at a food shelter or you know being able to advocate uh, for human rights, being able to get people to vote. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities to really get your uh, really have your student get their hands dirty in um, be, making a difference. So also there are plenty of project-based experiences um, that they'll be able to partake in. Your student will definitely be uh, benefit uh, from joining because MPT organizations are dedicated to high scholastic achievement. So there's a credit and a GPA requirement needed in order to join the organization and also to stay an active member. So like I said earlier, um, these, organiza these organizations are set on helping your student better themselves academically. And a lot of these requirements are actually even higher than university requirements. So because they expect excellence in their membership. And finally, MPHC organizations will benefit your student because they have the chance to be able to advance the public good. So MPHC organizations have specific goals and targets, um, such as working you know, with the, the second shut-in, um, working on social justice initiatives, uh, you know, being able to work uh, on bettering health, but they have every organization has specific goals and targets to help uh, improve the quality of life uh, for all people. So let's dig into the MPHC residential experience. So again, this is something that we typically get questions about. So um, I do know that the that the fraternity sorority community is heavily. Um, residential, but our MPHC organizations do not have residential facilities um, or houses uh, at the university. So they have the freedom to really choose what their residential experience looks like. So typically uh, chapters, so those are the local entities of the fraternities and sororities um, internationally um, here at Maryland. They stay together in houses around the College Park area um, in Prince George's County. Uh, sometimes different chapters will stay with one another. Uh, just because they've built community with each other. So that's typically how that experience will look like. However, uh, starting this year, I'm really excited to announce that on Fraternity Row, we do have a parking space um, that we have uh, renovated out of a former uh, uh, fraternity facility, which is now called the Agra. So the Agra in Greek means a place to gather, and that is the official programming space for our MPHC and our multicultural pre-council fraternities and sororities. So this is uh, three floor, uh, three floors, really four floors of program of classroom space, programming space, meeting space. Um, you know, students can practice um, for all types of things. There's also a 24/7 study space as well, uh, and this is just a place that has been taken off 
uh, in the past semester by our students. So it just opened this fall. And now like there's representation for these organizations and typically in a space that is uh, typically very white dominated. And I'm very happy to see that our university is taking the steps to be able to disrupt what it means to be in a fraternity and sorority and how we're supporting uh, our, our students of color, especially those that are involved in MPAC and MGC organizations. So let's talk about who's on the yard. So when I mean who's on the yard, I'm saying who is on campus. So typically, uh, MPAC organizations will say, "Oh, my yard is my campus." So that's what we're talking. That's what we're going to talk about right now. So going into the uh, active or established chapters at the university. So we have uh, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the Iota Zeta chapter, Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Theta Nu chapter. Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, the Theta Theta Chapter, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the Kappa Phi Chapter, and Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, the Eta Epsilon Chapter. So um, if you have social media at all, or have Instagram, um, or you can share this with your student, um, the handles for these active organizations are here. So also what I mean by active, that means they have students already in these chapters, um, they govern themselves, they are having events, um, and they are here on campus. So if your student is very um, much so a entrepreneur uh, or has that entrepreneurial spirit, they want to start things up uh, from the ground up. We have three organizations that are returning to our university this spring um, that I'm very, very excited about. So they are definitely, uh, they've been here four years and they um, are ready to restart their legacy on campus. So that will be Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, uh, the Epsilon Psi chapter, uh, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, the Eta Beta Chapter, and Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated uh, new chapters. So the fun fact about uh, both Phi Beta Sigma and Iota Phi Theta is that they are the first two MPHC organizations to be chartered on our campus. So very exciting um, news here. So let's talk about how to pursue membership uh, in an organization uh, within MPHC because it's very nuanced. So first thing I just have to say um, out the gate is that MPHC chapters do not have a formal recruitment process. Um, some of you may know that as Rush. Um, so, but each organization has their own membership intake process, also known as MIP. So MIP is the combined recruitment and new member education process for MPHC organizations. So MIP is chapter driven. Um, so I just want to say that again, MP, uh, so MIP is chapter driven. It occurs when a chapter deems it necessary to bring in new members. So historically, MIP occurs once a year, uh, typically in the spring, but again, it happens whenever a chapter deems it necessary to do so. So because it's chapter driven, you all might be wondering, well, how does my student, you know, get in contact with these organizations? How do they meet them and figure out what's the best fit for them. So they need to attend events. Um, every MPHC organization does have um, events during the semester. So either they'll have social events, they'll have educational events, community service opportunities. Um, these are for the campus community. So anybody who's anybody is able to uh, come out and be able to engage with the, the chapters on campus and just get a feel for who they are. And also knowing that, again, these are community-based organizations. So they're putting on these events for the community to come out to. I will say um, one big tradition at Maryland is that attire is a big thing. Um, so on the flyers, they will typically say what type of um, attire that they would want you to wear, so uh, or they would want your student to wear. So what is important is if there's no attire requirement, then um, I would recommend that your student uh, show up with a nice pair of jeans, a t-shirt, um, probably not with sweats um, or basketball shorts. Um, that's uh, typically not um, the be uh, typically not the best idea unless you know it's a workout event or something like that. So that's just something that I've I've seen here as an advisor. So attending events gives a uh, gives opportunities for your student to get to know the chapters on campus and their members. So each chapter here has a different personality. They have different objectives, different goals. Um, they might be similar, but uh, how they get to the end goal might be a little different uh, from, the, from another. 
So throughout this, this throughout this presentation, I'm going to be giving out some pro tips um, that you can share with your student to be able to help them hopefully get into the organization of their choice because sometimes it can be a long and grueling process to be able to do this. So first pro tip is being able to encourage your student to introduce themselves to at least one of the members in each of the orgs uh, on campus while attending uh, an event. So it can start to build relationships, especially if your student is still trying to get to know people or they're trying to find people who look like them. Um, these are just really great opportunities to be able to find a friend or a mentor that you didn't know that you would have. So with these organizations, um, typically, um, Interest in joining an MPAC organization should be kept between your student and the members of the organization that they want to join. Um, so sometimes you'll hear words about like discretion or secretiveness, but um, on the next slide, I want to share that <clears throat> for MPAC organizations, MIP is typically sacred. Um, it's you know very kept it's it's kept very close to the organization. So they they just want to make sure that they, this is. Um, a decision that somebody is making on their own and they're making a decision um, not for anybody else, but for themselves. Also, MPHC me uh, members are announced to the campus through what are known as new member presentations. Uh, sometimes they're known as probates, coming out shows, things like that, and they're revealed to campus uh, as a surprise. So I'll talk more about new member presentations in a second. But just because they uh, need to keep their interests hidden um, from the campus, um, in public doesn't mean that your student should keep that from you. So it's okay for your student to share their interests, um, share some of those public parts of their membership experience with you. Uh, it, it can be really hard uh, because you are, you know, attending events, um, you are on the lookout for a lot of things because it's a very independent process. So we'll, we'll talk more about how you can support your student in a second, but um, also just know that there are some things that they probably can't share with you because it's, um, closer to the organization um, in, their, in their ritual. So let's talk about how to join. Let's talk about what MIP will look like at a glance. So um, this is not the end all be all. So every organization does things different, but from what I've seen over the years, this is kind of what happens typically um, during an MIP process. So first, um, if you or a student is interested in joining, it's important to that they know what does it take to be eligible? So first, uh, here at the university, we require all of our students to have a 2.5 GPA and 12 credits to join any fraternity sorority uh, on campus. So, but to know that most MPC organizations require a range of 12 to 30 credits um, and a 2.5 to a 2.75 GPA minimum. So another pro tip is that encourage your students to try to go above and beyond what those requirements are. So these organizations are very competitive, just how it's competitive to uh, be a part of this uh, student entertainment events, um, student government, um, being able to run for the Spirit of Maryland Award in lieu of a homecoming king or queen. So there's a lot of different organizations that they will have to apply for and like that are GPA based. So making sure that like they're doing what they need to to stand out is great. At the same time, your students should not stress themselves out, stress themselves out trying to go far beyond the expectations. If it's not in the cards for them to join right now, um, there are alumni chapters where if they graduate and have a, a bachelor's degree, they will be able uh, to join an organization at the alumni level. Uh, there are alumni chapters all around the world, uh, so they'll be able to find one in, in the place that's near, near them. So just putting that out there. Uh, the next step is um, once your student realizes what organization they want to be a part of, they need to attend a membership informational meeting. And that's really what starts the MIP process. Sometimes they're called rush, but definitely attending is required. There's no way around it. They really do need to attend. So sometimes finding out about these meetings are, are typically hard, but uh, to give another pro tip, um, these meetings will be advertised most definitely on social media. Uh, social media is really how, really Instagram is how our students are engaging with one another. So um, making sure that they follow UMD MPHC on Instagram um, and turning their notifications on. If they don't have social media, they can still find things via TurfLink. Uh, they'll also be able to come into the office um, here uh, in the Stamp Student Union and ask questions. 
So also with um, some organizations, they are not uh, allowed to post things on social media because of policies that they have. Again, these are private organizations, so nothing that we have control over. But they will be um, posted in major buildings around campus in the Stamp Student Union, and we will definitely have those flyers posted on our bulletin board outside of the DFSL office. So um, the next point, um, is for, for informational meetings. Um, these are a chance to really learn about the organization, the values and principles in the application process and what that looks like. So these, organ so these meetings are very serious. So like these organizations take them very seriously. Um, they treat this as like one part of a job interview. So I'm, I want you to think of this as more of a three-step job interview than you know, a joining an organization in a way. But being able to attend an informational meeting um, will require them to have business professional or business casual attire. Now, if this is uh, an issue for your student, they need to have a conversation with the organization on how to get some, how to get things sponsored. Uh, these organizations will be more than willing to help. Um, and if they also need help finding, uh, finding things, they can come to DFSL and come to me and I can be able to uh, give them some assistance as well. So, um, also, another pro tip is make sure that your student brings something to take notes with. There's going to be a lot of information um, that they're going to need to write down uh, in a shorter amount of time. So making sure that they have everything that they need to make sure that they can complete the application packet. So like I was saying, every organization has some sort of application packet for interested candidates to complete. Um, it's going to be a really quick turnaround. Uh, in most cases, uh, candidates will need to submit their application packet within three days to two weeks on average. Uh, in some cases, the application packet is even due before the informational. So um, those are conversations that I would love for you to have with your student of, can they handle um, you know, being under pressure? Um, can they be able to manage um, that, that, those types of situations? So some of the things that might uh, be asked for in an applicant packet uh, would be a statement of purpose. So stating why you're interested in the organization, um, why are you interested in the local chapter at Maryland? Um, how would this organization benefit you as a person? What do you want to give to the organization? So thinking about things like that. Um, a resume um, will be helpful of like their uh, campus and community involvement, jobs that they have. Um, so again, this is very much so like a, a job interview type of process. An official transcript um, to ensure that they meet the requirements. So hopefully they uh, will have all of their holds cleared um, and not have anything to owe so that they're able to get the official transcripts. Um, letters of recommendation um, is definitely something that all organizations require. So typically two to three letters are asked from professors, mentors, or other community leaders that your student knows. Um, one of those letters will definitely be um, an uh, need to be from an active or finan active and financial me uh, member of the organization. And no, they don't have to be an alum of Maryland, but they'll need to be an active and financial member of the organization that your student is choosing to join. And also proof of community service um, might be something uh, that organizations look for and everyone has different requirements on that. Um, so the next part is after the packet has been submitted, um, your student might be called in for an interview. So most organizations will have an interview process. So the interview might be in person or virtual. So the interview should be treated like a job interview. So just how you would encourage your student to do some research on the job that they're applying for, the same should be for the organization that they're trying to join. So this is a great way for your student to learn interview skills, to be able to build and sharpen them as well. Um, so also when they're coming into the space for the interview, they need to make sure that um, they have a solid reason of why they're interested in joining. So this is more than just, oh, I saw y'all on campus, y'all are cool people, but like what is um, a really uh, like research-based reason? So like have they really looked up the organization? So again, like you want to have that research-based answer for a job, you want to do the same for um, a fraternity or sorority. So also, they'll need to know at minimum, again, another pro tip, the organizational values and principles. So a lot of people, they don't uh, know, know this stuff. And then they come into these interviews and like, okay, well, why are you joining if you don't really know like simple information? Like, 
um, about the or about the organization. So um, also, what are some of the international and local programs? All of those all of this information can be found on international websites. They are not a secret. Um, all you have to do is Google the organization. They will pop. Uh, they will pop up um, all the information that is public uh, knowledge. So those are some things to note when it comes to the interview. So um, hopefully your student by this point um, has passed the interview process, and if so, they'll be extended an invitation to participate in actual MIP. So MIP will consist of uh, educational ses sessions and modules uh, where candidates are taught and assessed on organizational protocol, customs, and history. So I want to take a pause here because a lot of people are typically wonder, how long does the uh, membership intake process take? So here at Maryland, all new member education and activities shall last no longer than six weeks. Um, so there are also organizations that are lesser than six weeks, um, but, def uh, but definitely our policy is um, it should take no longer than six, six weeks to complete a membership intake process or new member process for any of our fraternities and sororities here on campus. So, you know, another thing about MIP is that it can be very intense because, again, like you're learning a lot of information within six weeks. So I love to think of this as a short two to three credit course uh, with the lab, uh, just because of all of the work that goes into the organization. So um, again, they really need to learn, your student needs to learn time management. Um, they need to make sure they can balance multiple priorities um, in this. So candidates um, seeking membership will typically, will, need, uh, will typically need to achieve uh, an 80 to 100% on assessments um, that they will take to stay in the process. So if they don't do that, or if they don't fulfill other requirements, they might be released from the process. Um, so again, these are things that um, these members take very seriously because you know this is them learning um, the, the organization and how things run um, and just other things that will be needed to, um, to know to be able to be um, a full um, card carrying member of the organization. So again, time management is super, super important. So if your student you know, makes it through MIP, they complete all their requirements, um, they will be initiated into the organization. Uh, they will have all the full rights and privileges of being a member. Um, and also in most cases, um, they will finally be presented to campus uh, via a new member, new member presentation, again, also known as a probate coming out show. Um, everyone has different words for it, but here at Maryland, we use new member presentation. So this is a really fun event because um, people don't know what uh, organizations, uh, what, who people don't know who's going to be um, a part of the new organ, uh, part of the organization. Um, people like have masks. There's a lot of uh, performances. It's just a really fun time, um, and also just like a very exciting time because it, it marks the end of a journey and the beginning of a new one. So talking about cost of membership, uh, because this does cost, um, and it can it can cost it can cost a lot. But uh, on average, for new member dues, they are about $1,100 to $3,000 um, for them. And I'll be able to break that down. But it's, a, it's important that uh, your student is asking organizations for what the exact prices are. Um, and also, if they're saving up, it's better to have um, more saved up um, than enough than like nothing at all. So also, they'll need to pay everything up front. So there's not a lot of opportunity for a payment plan, but they'll need to talk individually with that organization that they're looking to join. So if you're paying almost about $3,000, what's included in it? What, um, are, what is your student giving their money to? What are you possibly giving your money to? Um, so new member dues typically include uh, one or more years of membership um, in the organization uh, to stay active. Also, there's an insurance coverage. So if your student um, is at an official uh, organization event and something happens to them, God forbid, then um, they'll be able to be covered by the organization. So this is not something that you can't opt out of. I know people do have insurance, but this is how the organization will also protect its members um, from any things that uh, happened, uh, happened to them. There might be a membership badge or a pin, um, different paraphernalia. So they might get a, a fancy jacket, um, a blazer, books, um, other things just with the organization um, on it. 
um, also being able to attend conferences. So there's a lot that goes into this um, these new member dues, and also they are this this price is uh, similar um, to our historically white organizations, um, but they just pay it over the semester. MPHC organizations just pay it up front. But the good news is once you become an active member, you'll uh, on average will pay around five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars. Uh, so let's talk about what your role as a family member uh, is in your student's membership intake process. So first, it's really important um, <clears throat> to be a sounding board for them throughout their pursuit of joining. So um, it's some good questions to ask is like, uh, are like, what are your personal values? Uh, what are some social justice causes um, that you care about? And you know, how does how does that apply uh, to some of the organizations on campus? So one thing I would really ask you know, of you to help them remember is that people don't join organizations, people join people. So they might seen them you know, step or stroll on campus. Um, they might have seen things on social media, but uh, making it's important that uh, helping us make sure that your student thinks through what their values are and ensuring that they're joining the best organization for them and not just like what looks cool or being the cool person um, on campus. So. Also being a support system, uh, again, it's very important to let them make decisions on their own. Um, and then also be a celebrator and a consoler. So, you know, celebrate um, the little wins, you know, be able to comfort them. Again, this is this can be a, a long and grueling process just because of, of the nature of it all. Um, and then also being a partner and a friend. So we in DFSL want to be partners to you. And uh, if you have any um, things that you would want to talk with us about. You, if you want to receive any advice, like we are here to support in that. That's why we exist on campus um, because you know we see our families uh, as really that those driving forces to be able to support um, those students. Again, especially when we're not around. So we definitely want to be a partner and a friend to you all. So some some tips and tricks to help support your turp. So first, let them vent. Again, this is a tough experience, just like any other application or interview-based opportunity at Maryland, and they're going to face some level of defeat. Um, sometimes they might be able to uh, join um, as soon as they start the process. Sometimes it might take them a, a year or so. Yeah, we, we don't know. Um, and sometimes they just need to have someone hear them out without having advice or feedback. So make sure to ask if they're looking for that, uh, if they ever talk with you. Um, understand that this is your student's experience. So don't let past experiences or things that you've heard about fraternity and sorority life impact their decision making. Um, <clears throat> also, again, making sure that your student is making decisions on their own. So sometimes it may be hard to accept um, as someone who cares about their student and you've really taken the time to help mentor them to be the person that they are today. But uh, especially if you're a, an alum of the organization that they're trying to pursue, but you, we have to make sure um, that they are making those decisions. They are making the hard choices. This is really one of the first times that uh, your students really going to be able to stand on their own two feet and like make the tough choices. Um, but and again, um, they should be making decisions based on the personal interactions that they have with chapters in Maryland and not social media. I cannot stress that enough. Um, so some conversation starters uh, with your student here that um, you could definitely have is being able to ask, what are some of your current priorities at school uh, besides academics? How does an MPHC organization fit into those priorities? Also, typically MPHC organizations average from 10 to 30 people, and you're more than and they're more than likely going to be able to have to balance multiple priorities. Um, asking, you know, can you handle doing that? Um, you know, how do you deal with stress? Uh, how do you um, work through tough situations. Uh, also remembering that MPHC organizations are community and values-based organizations. There's a lot of work involved in this. There's a lot of compliance. So not every moment of your, of your MPHC experience will be fun, but you're still going to do meaningful and impactful work. You're still going to have fun at the end of the day. Um, also making sure that they ask uh, the chapter, how do they contribute to the MPHC as a whole? Because once they join an organization, they're also joining UMD MPHC. So to share some upcoming student events, um, we will have an MPHC 101 student edition 
um, hopefully within the uh, within the first two weeks of the semester. So information will be shared uh, momentarily about that. Um, but there is the MPHC stroll off, uh, which is a timely uh, and loved tradition by the Black community. We are bringing that back uh, since the pandemic. So that's happening on Friday, 20, Friday, Friday February 24th at 7 p.m. in uh, the Hop Theater here in the Sam Student Union. Um, and then also our famous uh, tradition, as I stated, the UMD Block Show uh, will be occurring on Saturday, May 6th um, on Fraternity Row. So 7 Fraternity Row um, here in College Park. But if it rains, it will be here in the Sam Student Union in the Grand Ballroom. So uh, again, just wanted to share some resources. So my email is up here if you have any questions. Uh, also, your students can reach out um, to Kofi Owusu Mensa. Uh, he is the Vice President of Internal Affairs, and he is responsible for helping uh, students get connected to MPHC organizations on campus. His email is up here. Uh, we also now have a very robust uh, For Families page on our DFSL website. So that's fsl umd.edu. So please um, go visit there. Also, you can look at our general uh, Fraternity Story Life at uh, Maryland webinar if you just want to learn more about Fraternity Story Life as a whole here at the university. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so it looks like you covered everything that families wanted to know because there were no questions that came in through the Q&A. Um, but I will uh, keep us here for a little bit just in case folks want to put any questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, are there any other uh, bits of information or advice that uh, either you, Hamed, or Joel want to share um, with families that weren't already in the, in the presentation? I think it's um, important to know that like, to be persistent um, because this isn't just something that you can walk in and um, you know just just join. They really want to. I think these organizations are really serious about the people that they're bringing into the organization. So again, you know, to be very frank, it's important to come correct. Um, I think also um, there's going to have to be a lot of work um, done on the the students and to be able to find these organizations, build those relationships. Um, because like that's important it, because at the end of the day, um, you might really love an organization um, or see yourself in it because like the colors are cool or, you know, how they stroll or step is cool. But um, who are the people that you can be yourself around? Who are those people that um, if you need something, you know, in the middle of the night or you need to vent to, can you talk, can you talk to them? Because that's really what's important. And also that makes the experience uh, more meaningful because you're finding an organization that you actually want to be a part of instead of just being the cool kid on campus. Yeah, I was going to add too, um, although I'm, I'm not part of an MPHC organization, I am in an MGC sorority. And, you know, this is going to be organization specific, but I know a lot of times organizations are willing, like members who are already members of the organization are willing to talk to parents like who have concerns about, so if the parents or family members aren't Greek already or don't really have that understanding or if there are any cultural barriers, they're willing to have those more intimate conversations with parents to like kind of, you know, talk about what their concerns might be, explain things they maybe don't understand. There are members that might come from that cultural background who can be like, oh, I relate to this. I resonate with this. You know, I know there are a lot of students who might be first gen or like first one in their family to join a Greek org like I'm the only Greek uh, person in my family so like kind of having these chapter members that are willing to speak to parents about these concerns because they are valid or it might be just they don't know they don't understand so I know there are a lot of organizations who are willing to have those more intimate conversations to speak about the specific things that families might be worried about. Yeah, I I, I think that's a really great point. Uh, so, you know, even even for me, um, I am Liberian. So my uh, my family's from uh, West Africa. So that was a concern uh, for my parents. And I know we do have um, a lot of first generation Americans um, attending the university. So there are people who are able to make those connections and say like, hey, like I know how it was when I was trying to join connections. Um, and support you through that for sure. So that's something that's very unique, but also just very helpful um, about Maryland and, and the MPs. 
Great, thank you both for that. Um, well, it looks like there's no questions in the Q&A, um, which means that you did your job well. So um, I'm really thankful and appreciative of the folks that were able to join us today. Um, as I mentioned, uh, when we first started, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so once we are done here, I will get that uploaded to uh, the Turk Family YouTube channel. Um, so you can find that uh, at going on YouTube and just typing in Turk Family and you'll find us there. Um, and it'll have all of our uh, previous recordings. Um, you'll also receive a email um, asking for feedback on the webinar. Um, so how we did today, as well as topics that you're interested in. Um, I thoroughly enjoy engaging with uh, campus partners across the university. So if there's other topics, um, other areas of campus that you're wanting to learn more about, please feel free to share that as well. Um, and I can see about getting some more uh, webinars scheduled with those departments. Um, I appreciate you joining us today um, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks everyone.